folks, we're going to get started shortly. Two quick notes. On your seats, you'll see the uh, copy of the Scattered Seeds that came out on uh, uh, Thursday, uh, day before the first, and it contains the Dietrich Bonhoeffer story. You can read this book which is 600 pages, or you can read this, which is 15 minutes. Your choice. It's a great book. It is a great book. It is a great book. Um, and what I did, and I'm going to be using this as kind of a thumbnail for walking through Bonhoeffer's life and story. You know, it's a complicated story, as anyone's life is. And, uh, you know, I think it will help us, help guide us through the material. Um, so that's available. If, you, if there are any extra copies that you need, they're right here. So I was reading through uh, Valley Vision this morning, uh, which is a Puritan uh, um, uh, a devotional that uh, my wife Louise gave to me several years ago, and she had gotten a copy many years before. And in the uh, just the front page, she had two things that I caught that I thought they're good reference points for today. Um, he was born like me that I might become like him. It's pretty simple, but for the first day of Advent, he, he was born like me that I might become like him. And then Louise had uh, from Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5, Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you made us and we are yours. Help us to embrace that reality each and every day, to lean into it, to learn to love it to put to death our fleshly desires and to come under, under you and into your presence, to become true followers of Jesus Christ in every aspect of our lives, to become more fully reliant on you. Help us in this Advent season to prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of our King, to learn the way of the manger to live under kingly and costly discipleship. We commit this time to you, and we ask your blessings upon it in the furtherance of your kingdom. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. All right, welcome back. Thank you. Quick drink of water. So we introduced the subject last week. The uh, title of the class is, of course, Here I Am, Lord. And Louise introduced you um, to the to Moses. Uh, what we're doing is we're pairing three biblical characters and three contemporary modern characters to look at um, at their declarations and how that was manifested in their lives. Here I am, Lord. We'll be talking. Take a little bit of time at the very end of the class. Uh, to reflect on some questions, because I think this is a subject that really does require personal reflection and personal intersection. So what Louise said last week is, uh, you know, we're introducing you to people that have been quoted as saying these words. There's six in the Bible, uh, five Old Testament figures and, and one uh, New Testament. And we're also introducing you to, to people who have uttered these perhaps not these exact words, but have lived their lives in accordance with that statement, here I am, Lord. And so, uh, you know, Louise went through Moses just real briefly, uh, chapter th Exodus chapter 3, the Exodus account of the burning bush, and I thought this was an, a very interesting point. As Louise noted, all Moses did at that crucial moment was turn back. He turned back. And what could be more ordinary? or simple than a turning back. The bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. That piqued his curiosity. We're told in verse 2 of, of chapter 3. Then verse 3, Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush, uh, the bush is not burned. Then verse 4, 
uh, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. It's pretty simple. Um, and so what we're trying to look for is patterns in our own lives of where we've said that statement, here I am. I'll give you a, uh, a personal reflection on that if, if, if the, uh, toward the end of the class. And so we paired Moses and Bonhoeffer, and it's a loose pairing. I, I don't want you to think about this in terms of, you know, uh, very tightly knit lives. That's not our point, but it's the loose pairing. Because but we did notice similarities between their lives. Um, their both fam birth families were both very well-to-do. You'll see that in the Bonhoeffer story very shortly. Uh, they left everything to follow God. Um, they weren't permitted to see the fruition of what they'd begun. Bonhoeffer was ex executed three weeks before Hitler killed himself and four weeks before the war ended. And in fact, his body was thrown on a pile with other Jews and, and burned. And Bonhoeffer identified with the plight of the Jews in Nazi Germany, just as Moses had identified with the plight of the Israelites in uh, ancient Egypt. Okay, so the other thought uh, from last week that I just want to touch on briefly, uh, and then we're going to show a video, a quick one, uh, two minutes is that uh, the lives of each of the historical figures that we're examining in this class, Bonhoeffer today, next week is going to be the Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was the author of the Gulag Archipelago, hugely influential book. It is the book, essentially, that brought down the Soviet Union. And then uh, in, in two weeks from today, on, on week four of the class, uh, Watergate fell in Chuck Colson. That's on December 17th. So each of those people spent time in prison. I think that's a very, very important thing. Now, I'm not saying that we have to uh, spend time in prison to further our relationship with God. That's not my point. But m what my point is, is that, and it's a point that Bonhoeffer makes very consistently in his writings, if you read Bonhoeffer, you'll see this repeatedly. It's our wilderness experiences that define us. It's not our conquests. It's our perceived defeats that define us as Christians. Um, it's, um, that is the, is the terrain against which spiritual formation plays out and is molded. And so Bonhoeffer wrote that... Uh, that Christ expresses strength best through weakness, and that God is often heard most clearly by those in poverty and distress. And so I think if you examine your own lives, as I have examined in my life, it was in those moments of wilderness, in those moments of quiet and sometimes very vocal desperation where I found the Lord most acutely. I think that's an extraordinarily important point. And all three men, Bonhoeffer, Solzhenitsyn, Colson, moved monumentally. In Solzhenitsyn's case, he moved entirely to Christ. In the other two cases, they moved significantly in their walk with Jesus during prison experiences. Um, uh, it's, it's also a quotation famous uh, from C.S. Lewis, who I've studied ad nauseum. I'm not Andy talking about him in this class, <laughs> but I will bring up one. But you did say his name. But I did say his name. Yeah, it's the first time. First time. Um, you know, Lewis said once, God shouts to us in our pain. And um, I think it's worth pondering. Okay. So as I was studying the, uh, the Bonhoeffer story and rereading it, I've been acquainted with it for a long time. And I, as I said last week, I was a correspondent in, in Germany for the Wall Street Journal. That further acquainted me with Bonhoeffer's story. You know, I've been fascinated by his story for probably 50 years. Um, when I was reading through it, I thought, 
this is so cinematic. How is it that there's never been a movie that's made, been made of Dietrich Bonhoeffer? It's an extraordinary story. How did, how did it avoid Hollywood's uh, notice? And 10 days ago, roughly, I got uh, an email. I get an a, a email feed from Eric Metaxas. I'm, I'm his, uh, you know, his fan. Um, and lo and behold, there is a movie coming out of Bonhoeffer. Angel Studios is producing it. I got the teaser in my box, and Bob is now going to show it. Hitler has captured the nation's imagination. Bravery is the real commodity. You will go to England as a spy. What good is the judge if it doesn't speak for the victims of the state? The church's job is to kindle peace, peacefully. Oh, you mean silently? I need you to understand that your life will not be the same after I speak these words. We have devised a plot to assassinate the Fuhrer. Guide our hands. Guide our trembling hands. Lords and Germany, a true savior! Our silence in the face of evil is itself evil. Words aren't words anymore, Dietrich. Then this is bullets. This is a trigger that cannot be unpulled. God forgive us if we do this. Will you forgive us if we don't? Um, but they came to the, you know, the producers, Angel Studios. Uh, we had a podcast recently where uh, one of our guests, who's a movie producer in Hollywood, uh, talked about Angel Studios. Um, you know, they 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 clicked on, um, they gravitated to that story for some of the same reasons that I've gravitated to Metaxas's books. Let me give you three quick reasons of why. I think it's worthy of your time to be reading his work. Uh, they're remarkably engaging and compelling stories. I mean, these are stories about people who are living real life problems and acting them out in real time, and they're historical. Uh, so you can check the historical accounts. Um, and for that reason, you know, if you look at the three books that I mentioned last week, uh, Seven Women, Seven Men, Seven More Men. It is a little warm in here. Maybe somebody could turn up the, the uh, air conditioning. That's kind of weird in December, but... Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the stories themselves, I think of the 21 people that he's written about in these three... Just open it. Okay. Um, I think of the 21 people he wrote about in the three books, I counted 10 movies that have been made out of the 21. So these are very, very compelling cinematic type stories. Uh, Hollywood doesn't always ignore uh, good Christian stories, although they don't always tell them in a Christian vein. So that's the first reason. Um, the second reason that I think uh, Metaxas's excuse me, works are worthy of your attention, is they illustrate how people use their gifts and put their gifts to use in service to God. Um, and I, we're not talking about Eric Little, but you probably know the Eric Little story. That's one of the people he focuses on on Seven Men. Eric Little was the 1924 Olympic runner for Great Britain, it was made into Chariots of Fire. It's probably the greatest film. It won the Academy Award for Best Picture in 1982, and uh, an extraordinary movie. If you haven't seen it, watch it. It's the Eric Little story. The Eric Little story, real quickly, because I want to get to the quote that I love from the movie. Um, and this is what Little says, famous quotation. He's talking to his sister, Jenny. Right, we all remember the scene. If you've seen the movie, it's probably the most moving scene in, in in the film. 
um, Jenny is pleading with him to go to China as a missionary because he had been born in China. His parents were missionaries in, in China. He was putting off his time as a missionary to run in the 1924 Olympic Games, which he subsequently did and won a gold medal for an event that he wasn't even supposed to run because he refused to run on Sunday. Because the 100 meters was scheduled on Sunday, he ended up r running 400 meters. This is what he says to Jenny. Uh, it's a, a quotation that Nate and I have often traded back with each other because it's, you know, it's so unbelievable. Uh, I believe God made me for a purpose. God has made each of you for a purpose. Little is no different than anyone else in that respect. I believe God made me for a purpose, he, but he also made me fast. When I run, I feel his pleasure. When I run, I feel his pleasure. When I write, I feel God's pleasure. That's why I do what I do. That's why I've done it for five years. God is using me as his vessel and his instrument to communicate to you. I believe that. I believe that down to my socks. That's why I give socks to everybody on the staff every year. Um, so what's the point in that for us? The point is that we all must identify what our gifts are. Everyone's gifts are unique. Some people have gifts in writing. Some people are fast. I don't think anybody in that room would qualify as fast, but, or this room would qualify as fast, but maybe. Um, you identify what your gifts are, and you put them to use in service to God here. You hear God, and you say, here I am, God. I am your vessel today to do your work. Okay, that's the second aspect. The third aspect I love about these stories is that they're great apologetics. And what I mean by an apologetic is they testify to the existence of God. Now, I obviously believe in the existence of God, but there have been times in my life when I did not, or at least I had doubt. Can't say as I ever went so far as to deny the existence of God, but I've had doubts in my life, early in my life, and in various wilderness experiences that were so difficult I wondered if God was listening to me. So these stories testify that God is moving amongst us, sometimes in extraordinary ways. How can you explain, for the second time, C.S. Lewis, how can, can you explain what happened to C.S. Lewis? He's an atheist. He publishes one book. He has a miraculous moment with God, and he ends up writing 60 books. That's the C.S. Lewis story in a nutshell. Um, it's the same thing with Solzhenitsyn that we'll talk about next week. He's a Marxist atheist. He goes into the Soviet gulag. He has a remarkable witness from a prisoner who's in the cell next to him who brings him to Jesus. He comes out. He decides that that's the reason God wants me to live because he thought he was going to die in prison. God saved me for a purpose, and the purpose was to write a book about my experiences in the gulag that will further his kingdom. He does that. He runs, wins the 1973 Nobel Prize for Literature, even though they were trying to repress publication of the book, desperately the Soviet Union was. This is the gulag archipelago that we're talking about. And lo and behold, 17 years later, the very thing that he's writing about comes to pass. How can you explain such things other than through God? There's no explanation. None. Okay. So um, on Bonhoeffer, I wanted, I didn't want to, I, I produced what I did. The Lord produced what he did through me in the scattered seeds, to get you through the story. It's a complicated story, but let's go through it real quickly. 
uh, in about the 10, 10 or so minutes that we have. Um, in the first part, there's, so there's, there's seven panels to the story. Um, that's how I broke it down, because I had seven pages to fill. <laughs> Uh, but I thought it actually broke down fairly well that way. So the part one is the way of the manger. Um, and, you know, there's a dichotomy here that I think is worth mentioning. There was a book that was popular a couple of years ago called Gentle and Lowly. Um, and its thesis is a very, very popular book. It's a bestseller. And its thesis, if I could summarize it in two sentences is that Christ's truest identity is his intercessory role as our gentle and loving friend and advocate. Now, I'm not denying that Jesus is our friend and advocate. Of course he is. He's, uh, there, there's no denying that. Um, but there's kind of a paradigm that this shifts on, which is, is Jesus our servant or are we his servant? That's the really critical question. Gentle and lowly in my reading of it says, Jesus is our servant. He's there to help us. He's there to befriend us. He's, he, uh, not that we are his servants. Bonhoeffer believes firmly in the second proposition. Jesus is not there to make us feel good. Jesus is there to transform our lives, to change us, so that we serve him in his kingdom. That's our purpose as Christians. And so um, that's the different paradigm, and it's the paradigm of costly discipleship. Costly discipleship. When Christ bids a man, he, he tells him, come and die come and die. And that's what he literally did. He went and died. died. He was hung on the gallows, April 9th, 1945, naked. Some accounts say he was hung with piano wire to intensify the pain. I, I have not, they're, they're differing uh, in, differing in historical interpretations of that, because his body was burned, it was not saved. It, you know, there was no autopsy done. There's no way of knowing what actually occurred. Um, so what I'm trying to do in part one is kind of put up, put a because I use the phrase gentle and lowly in that uh, opening um, opening part. I'm trying to put an exclamation point. I'm trying to italicize these two divergent views. What's Christ's role? What is it? Is it to make us feel comfortable? Is it the gentle and lowly thesis? Or is it that we are his servants? And that through servanthood to him, we might find ourselves sometimes in very, very uncomfortable positions. But that's the call. That's what we signed on for as Christian. Christians. I am definitely in the second Bonhoeffer camp. So I just wanted to clarify that up front. Um, yeah? Transformation is inherently uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> if you're comfortable, you don't transform. Right. That's right. That's right. We've had discussions many times, Dean, on this very point. Okay, part two. Um, Bonhoeffer's born February 4th, 1906. Extraordinary family. Amazing family. He could have taken the comfortable road. He chose not to. Um, brother dies. Um, in World War I, Brother Walter goes to the front, goes to the Western Front, two weeks later is killed, devastating to the family, absolutely devastating. Walter was killed. Uh, mother has a mental breakdown, um, was not the same for years afterward. Very, very strong spiritual mother, though. Homeschooled all eight children. Um, 
always, they were rich and wealthy, so they hired governesses, but always hired, hired strictly Christian governesses. So that's the environment Dietrich was born into. His father was, um, his father Klaus, very prominent psychiatrist, probably the most prominent psychiatrist in Germany in the 20th century. Um, very well connected, wealthy family. Uh, statesman, artist, you name it, and the Bonhoeffer family represented it. And on the maternal side, very strong theology. Uh, both his grandfather, both Dietrich's grandfather and his great-grandfather were famous theologians. So you see that manifestation. Uh, part three, panel three. This is where we go into the birth of costly discipleship. Um, makes a faithful decision at the age of 13, right around his confirmation time. And in the page, I, I quote... Uh, uh, I quote the text that, uh, from James that, uh, that he memorized for his confirmation. Um, he uh, he decided to, decides to pursue a career in theology. His, parent, his, his siblings were, what? What are you doing? What are you doing with your life? Um, but he, uh, that's the path he's on. By the age of 21... He is uh, such a distinguished student. He has earned his doctorate, his PhD in theology from Berlin University, very prestigious university. But he can't even become an ordained pastor in the Lutheran Church until the age of 25. So he does postdoctoral studies. And one of the postdoctoral studies he did was at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Very important moment in his life. Um, he attended Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, which at that time was the largest church in the United States. Uh, it was uh, pastored by Adam, the Reverend, Dr. Reverend Adam Clayton Powell Sr. Uh, he was the son of a Cherokee mother and an African-American father. Uh, and it was there that he first encountered the phrase cheap grace. It was Adam Clayton Powell's. I don't know if Powell got it from someone else, but that's where it came from. Um, and so what's cheap grace? What's the importance of that? Uh, as Bonhoeffer defines, so later he develops this thesis. By 37, he published, publishes The Cost of Discipleship, important book. Uh, and in the book, um, Bonhoeffer defines cheap grace as uh, the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. That's cheap grace. The, cheaping, the, the preaching of forgiveness, well, we're all Christians. We should forgive each other. What are we talking about here? Well, you can't forgive someone unless they've repented of their sin, unless they've named it, identified it, and repent of it. That's central to the, to the idea of costly discipleship. It's communion, communion without confession. can't have communion, can't be communed with God unless you've confessed your sins. Sometimes people get a little weird on this because they see it, see it as a Catholic thing. No, no, it's, it's very, very scriptural. Uh, it's grace without discipleship. There is something that is commanded of you as a believer of Jesus Christ. Period, full stop, end of story. Um... It's grace without the cost. So in other words, he says, effectively, he doesn't use this phrase, but grace, cheap grace is a divine get-out-of-jail-free card. True de discipleship, on the other hand, is costly. It merits the cost. It is something that demands sacrifice of you. Something we're all learning quite a bit of in, in the current circumstances in our church. Part four, opposing those who mock God uh, because of his time at Abyssinian. Um, he's staggered by what he sees, by the communion that these people have. It's a covenant community. They, they bear each other's burdens. They're joyful in worship. Uh, he had never seen that. Um, but also that there's a point to your faith. It should lead to action. 
it should lead to conscience, a pricking of your conscience so that it changes you, it transforms you, to, to go back to what Dean said. It has to manifest itself in your life. And then, um, coincidentally, there's no coincidences with God, he has this experience, he's working on the book, and then in 1933, Adolf Hitler is in, in January of 33, very end of January, uh, he, uh, Hitler is named Chancellor of Germany. The entire family, the Monhofer family, is opposed to Hitler. So uh, I mentioned the radio address. Just two days after Hitler becomes Chancellor, Bonhoeffer delivers a radio sermon in which he publicly criticized the new regime and warned Germans that the Fuhrer concept could become a Verführer, a misleader or a seducer. You have to know a little German to understand that. A Fuhrer is a leader. A Verführer is a misleader. Um, and if Hitler were, were idol, uh, idolized and elevated to too far of a status, um, his radio address is shut off at the end. So uh, the Listeners were not able to hear leaders of offices which set themselves up as gods, mock God. They didn't hear that, but two months later he comes back at it again uh, and uh, starts talking about uh, Hitler's persecution of the Jews. Here on part five is the most crucial turning point in the life. This is, this is what I would identify as the um, here I am God moment. Um, he goes back to the United States uh, because he's not sure what to do. This is 1939. This is June of 1939. In September 1st of 1939, we all know what happened. German tanks ro ro roll into Poland. He's, he's struggling with what to do. He decides to, to try to go to America. He gets uh, help from Rein uh, Reinhold Niebuhr. Um, and, uh, wait a minute, I'm, yeah, Reinhold Niebuhr. And uh, um, everything's in order. He's going to be able to return to the United States to, to teach at Union Theological Seminary where Niebuhr taught. He sails for America, and then 26 days later, he sails back. He says, I can't do this. My conscience will not permit this. Costly discipleship demands something of me. Uh, of me, I must return to Germany. It is the Moses, here I am moment, in my view. Um, his friends back in Germany are shocked to see him. They say, why do you did, did you return? He writes a lengthy letter. You have it in there. I don't want to spend the time reading it, um, where he spells out why I returned. Part six, Af thereafter he starts working for the Abwehr, which is the intelligence service in Germany. The intelligence service was a nexus for uh, challenges against Hitler. And um, he, um, through his brother-in-law, who was a very high official in the Abwehr, he's solicited, you saw it in the video, as a anti-Hitler agent, essentially. Spirits Jews out of Germany through that, to neutral countries like Switzerland and, and Sweden. And um, he says, to do anything less would be to buy into the idea of cheap grace that I had so eloquently, that Metaxas writes, that he had so eloquently written about. Okay, so, um, and then on April 5th of 1943, he does this for about three years, he's arrested. Um, on suspicions of treason, which would be punishable by death. But at first, his, his uncle was uh, the head of the Tegel, uh, was the head of military operations in Berlin, and the prison that he's first put in is Tegel, which is in seven miles from his house, where he lived at that time. Um, he's arrested, arrest, put in Tegel prison, but then you have the Valkyrie plot in July of 1944. That's a plot to kill Hitler. It was the most, uh, it was unsuccessful, but it was the most successful plot that ever, there were many, many plots to, to kill Hitler, but this one, it failed. 
documents are revealed, um, and uh, um, and then uh, it gets to be a very sticky for Dietrich Bonhoeffer and also his brother-in-law. His brother-in-law was brutally tortured. Uh, Bonhoeffer doesn't appear to have been. Um, he's transferred from a variety of prisons, ends up at Flossenburg concentration camp in rural Bavaria. I've never been to Flossenburg, um, but, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, concentration camps are memorialized in Germany, or many of them, and, and you can still visit them to this day. Um, and then it sets up his, uh, uh, his final, uh, uh, the, plot, uh, the uh, moment when he is uh, put to death uh, on April 9, 1945, executed while hanging, uh, by hanging, while naked. Uh, he was 39. And as I say in the final panel seven, uh, there'd be a way of looking at this as uh, from a secular perspective of what a tragedy. And in Bonhoeffer's perspective, his final words were, this is the end, but for me it is the beginning of life. He was leaning in and living into the uh, life that God had illuminated to him. And G Bishop George Bell at his... Uh, um, at his uh, memorial service on July 27th in London said, uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It's a famous phrase. It's been used many, many times. I, I heard it in a R.C. Sproul sermon recently. Uh, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Um, and read at his, uh, I think what we're going to do is put this over to I've gone a little bit longer than I intended to. I apologize for that. Um, but we'll put the question off till next week. Read the Bonhoeffer stuff. Reflect on that question there. Have you ever heard or sensed God's call to his purposes? What happened? Share. If you could reflect on that, and when you co we come back in a week, um, offer some thoughts on that, on that as it relates to your life. Here's, here's my story. Uh, that I want to close with. Um, uh, Friday was the fifth anniversary that I've been in this job. December 1st, 2018 uh, was my fifth anniversary. Hmm? <laughs> anniversary. <laughs> and five years ago, I was teaching this very class, the same Advent class. It wasn't with Louise. It was with, uh, it was with Paul Bell. Um, and... Uh, how did that come about? And I'll share this, Kara's in the room, so uh, apologies if I'm, I'm too personal, but we've shared some of the story publicly. Uh, on May 19th of that year, 2018, Kara uh, had a baby that died, Amos. Um, in the three weeks after that moment, uh, I re-examined my life. I said, literally, Lord, uh, what do you want me to do with the remaining years of my life? I was at the Post-Gazette. I'd been in the newspaper business for 40 years. The newspaper business was going down the drain. No, no surprise there. Uh, and they were asking me to lop off the extremities of that newspaper print business that I had essentially built at the Post-Gazette. And I, and I looked at that. And I looked at what was the meaning to me in this moment of tragedy. What was I to do with that? Uh, we went to North Carolina on vacation. Uh, talked to Dave, David Clark extensively about this. Prayed about it. Um, and as God is my witness, uh, I came out of that three-week period saying, Here I am, Lord. What would you have me do with this situation? Um, we get home, and there's a letter from Rick, Rick Walling on the uh, coffee table. The mail was strewn about. And I, it was the first letter I opened up because I thought, why is Rick Walling writing? Not to me personally. It was a congregational letter. Uh, it said, we have an opening for a communications person. 
I thought, well, that's curious. It's very interesting that that co coincided with this circumstance. Um, I called Rick up. I talked to him about it. I called Nate up because Nate was the designate then. Talked to him about it. And, uh, and in the course of the next six months, uh, I decided to leave the job that I loved. I did love newspapering. I love it for many, many reasons. Um, I decided to leave that and move into this job. Now, five years have passed, and now we're in the circumstance we're in. Uh, and I don't know what will happen on February 4th. I have no idea. But I know that God called me to this purpose for this time to be in this job and that my responsibility is to him first and to you second. Um, and so I don't think it will lead lead to my literal death. Uh, I hope not. Um, but I will tell you that I am prepared to die. I am prepared to die. I am ready. I've had a good life. And if that is what the purpose is in this, then I've heard God's call. And I am listening and I am a willing servant of his through this circumstance. So um, that's a very, very quick version of my story. I did run longer than I expected. I thought that would happen because the Bonhoeffer story is so, so compelling. I'd encourage you to read Metaxas. He's a brilliant writer. Uh, he identifies things in extraordinary ways. Uh, he is a very, very devout and committed Christian. And um, uh, he's been enormously helpful to me in my walk. I love reading histories. Um, it's a function of just who I am. Uh, one of the things that you get as a teacher, you know, you get the work, but you also get to choose who you want to talk about. <laughs> and so I got to choose the three people that I most wanted to talk about because it intersects with situations in my own life. Um, Germany and the history, 20th century history of Nazism with Bonhoeffer, uh, the Soviet bloc, which I covered when I was over in Germany, and then Watergate. Uh, I, probably between those th three events in world history in the 20th century, I've, I've probably read 50 books total on these subjects. I'm kind of obsessed with 20th century history, partly Louise's fault. Um, her, <laughs> I'll close with just a f real quick funny story. Yeah, any questions? I'm sorry. Comments, questions? Uh, there's a vote in the church about our affiliation with, uh, uh, with the denomination, uh, the EPC. Yeah. Um, I'll just tell you, close with a funny story. Uh, I, I had kind of a classical education in uh, college. Uh, read a lot of liter English literature and read um, uh, a lot of military history, a lot of history in general. Uh, Louise's grandfather, it turned out, the first time I met him was at his, their house in Virginia. Louise's grandfather was Patton's Signal Corps officer. He was on the staff of General George S. Patton. Okay, you may have heard of him of the Third Army. <laughs> Um, and any doubts I had about, about marrying Louise were completely removed at that moment because I got to sit in the den of General, Brigadier General Elton Foster Hammond, who's now interred at, uh, uh, at Arlington Cemetery next to Edmund Muskie. Um, and we visit him often. But any doubts I had about marrying Louise were completely r removed on that day because I said, I've been reading about this stuff for years, and here I am sitting with a man who knew personally Patton, Eisenhower, MacArthur. It was like it was like a dream come true. I, I was 
Also, I was, yeah, also I was, <laughs> yeah, I said, I said that this closed the deal. This closed the deal. I think the next day I called my mother and said, "I've met the woman I want to marry." <laughs> Patton said I had to. That's right. All right. Uh, thank you for your time, and uh, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, your love and your grace. We thank you that, uh, uh, that we are your disciples. We've been called out by you for that purpose. Help us to live and lean into costly discipleship, Lord, uh, to understand that in this life, uh, you are training us for uh, uh, for a future life with you in eternity, uh, and we are um, are we are yours to mold and to shape in the in your will and in the way that you want us to go. Uh, thank you for this church and its offices and its leaders. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.